All right, everyone, I'd like to thank you for sticking in with us here. Um, we have our next presenter. The simulation and modeling uh, session is Megan Pulaski. She's a graduate research assistant at RPI, currently working on her PhD in electrical engineering. She primarily works with modeling, simulation, and system identification for both traditional power systems and electrified aircraft. She is the 2020 recipient of the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. She's here to talk to us about UAV dynamics and electrical power system modeling and visualization using Modelica and FMI. Megan, please take it away. Hi, hi everybody, I'm Ian Pileski. Um I also did this work with my advisor, Dr. Luigi Mepredi, um, and then a research scientist in our lab, Dr. Hamed Nudemi, and an undergrad Druid researcher, Hao Chang. Next slide. So today I'll bring you through the Modelica drone library, why we use Modelica, the different um, components that comprise of the drone, and then the animation and visualization of the drone and some analysis for the power system, looking at the different kind of machines and the effects of the converters and the power system on the drone dynamics, as well as the effect as the battery on the drone. Um, we'll look at some noisy flight path reference tracking and then our conclusions. Next slide. Okay, so this Modelica drone library is an open source library um, made from the Modelica programming language. It consists of multi-domain models. When I talk about multi-domain, I mean we're looking at multiple engineering domains, as in the electrical domains and all of the electrical equations that would pertain to those models, like Ohm's law, the mechanical equations, and all the mechanical properties, um, looking at both rotational and force dynamics, and then the control signals going in and out and PID functions from that domain. Um, all the models are separated into various packages to model each of the components from the drone. And this library can be used to model any kind of drone. Right now, we have examples for the Otis quadcopter, the Mavic Air, and the Phantom quadcopter. Um, primarily in this presentation, we're only focusing on the Otis quadcopter. And the link to download this open source library is at the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide. So why do we use Modelica? It's not a tool, but it's an equation-based object-oriented modeling language. Everything in this library, for the most part, is made with this open source Modelica standard library. So if you want to download it, and we have it so that you can use it for any sort of classroom um, and those sorts of activities as well, you don't have to have any proprietary models. The only time you'll need proprietary models for this library is when you want to study higher order, more detailed power system um, models. So this models developed using Modelica can be used in tons of other tools. There is something called an FMI standard. So all of the models that we develop can be packaged up using C code and imported into another tool like Simulink. Um, and then you can use the other tools analysis features, and you can simulate your model in that tool. Next slide. Okay, so this is what our drone simulation library looks like. On the left, we have the blocks, and then inside of the blocks, we have our sources, our control functions, mathematical functions, and routing functions. These are all customized signal blocks that we can use to create flight paths for the drone. We also have custom sensor functions for the drone that can track the position and acceleration of the drone that are in the sensors package. For example, we have the GPS model, which uses the relative position of the drone to track its position with respect to ground. And this is used to change the flight path of the drone. And we also have an accelerometer that checks the relative angle of the pitch yawn roll of the drone's airframe. Next slide. Next, we have our electrical components. This sub package consists of sources, machines, power electronics, and control modules. Here, our power system is based off of the Otis quadcopter. The um, overall schematic showing the hierarchy of that power system is shown on the left. We have a three cell LiPo battery operating at 11.1 volts, powering a DC to DC step down converter to control the voltage supplied to the Raspberry Pi and all external sensors, and then we have the battery directly connected to the four motors. 
Next slide. Okay, this is a top level view of the drone. Um, we have, looking at it, we've got our sources inside of the orange box, which is our batteries. Our battery is modeled using the Shepard equations. We are modeling a lithium ion 18650 battery with three cells in series, which is the same that we've used in the quadcopter. The equations that we used, which are the Shepard's equations, are shown at the bottom of that box. In the blue box, we have our power electronics. These can try, contain the models for the DC to DC converters and the switches used in the drone. Um, right now, we're using just a switched box DC to DC converter, but in the future, when you want to study longer periods of time um, simulating this drone, you'll switch to an average converter. This is because um, switch converters, typically when you simulate them, we need to reevaluate the states of the transistors at every time step, which can take a really long time if you want to study the drone's operation for anything more than like a minute or 30 seconds of simulation time. And finally, we have the machines. This is, they are located inside of this propeller block. Um, most UAV systems use brushless DC motors for their high efficiency and high power to size ratio. So we're looking at an ideal DC machine. And then we wanted to study a permanent magnet DC machine to see how the operation of the drone changes when we add in some non-ideal behaviors and losses. Next slide. Next, we have our controllers. So we have a controller to control the main operation of the drone, which is a consists of just multiple PID blocks. It ensures a stability along all the axes, and it uses the GPS role, yaw, and desire position of the drone to determine what position signals we're sending to each of the motors. You'll also note that there is an orange box that contains the, a resistance to couple with the electrical system. This couples right to the battery, and it allows us to model the electrical losses of the aggregate electrical consumption of the control system. We're assuming that this um, electrical consumption doesn't vary much over the period of time, so we just model it as a constant resistance. We also have a speed controller, which determines the voltage applied to each motor based on the battery's state of charge and the position signal from the main controller. Next slide. Next, we have our mechanical models. So we have two different kinds of propeller models. We have A, which is when we use a non-ideal or an ideal power source, and we have B when we use a non-ideal power source. So each of these motors consists of a motor, a rotor, and a blade block. Um, you can see in the left, we have a couple different colored um, connections connecting the different blocks together. So we have our dark blue box, which are our real signals, which come from the controller, which is determined by the PID block outputs. And then we have in block B, we have that other blue line, which is at square P1 and connecting into the motor, which is the electrical connection from the battery to determine how much voltage we can supply to each motor. And then we have our light gray connections, which are mechanical variables to represent the multi-body connections between each of the components. The way we set this up, it allows for better organization of the models and for different variables we interface with components. It also allows us to switch between levels of complexity a lot easier than setting up new models each time. Next slide. So we also have this chassis model too to model the um, body of the drone. So this chassis subpackage control contains the model of the drone's airframe. It's similar to the way we model the blade models. Everything's just single point masses, which are as denoted by all of those body shape um, components. I also want to note that we have this fixed shape component, um, which is that like rectangular square thing, um, which has it allows us to integrate a 3D object file of the drone chassis for when we want to animate and simulate this drone. The chassis is mechanically linked to each of the propellers where each of those frame components on the side are connected to a propeller. And the inertia tensors of the chassis is modeled as those equations in the matrices below. Next slide. So going back to the propeller, we have our blade model. It's similar to the chassis model. We have just two single body masses um, to model the blades. And then we also have that fixed shape component so we can model the blades as a separate 3D object when we animate the drone. Um, and we also are assuming that the relationship between angular speed of the propeller shaft 
and the thrust is assuming that it's linear. Next slide. So now we're looking at the rotor. This mechanically links the torque from the machine to the revolute to spin the blades. Um, the speed is turning at a scaled measurement, rel the relative um, angular velocity between torque one and torque two, which come from the machine. And we're also having applying a force from the machine as well. Uh, the torque is also determined, the aerodynamic torque is determined from a simple omega squared model, which we have determined as such in the blue box below. Next slide. Next, we have our motor model. So this motor sends a thrust and two torques to send, um, spin the rotor. So the motor takes in an input position data and translate that into a force and a torque from the electrical motor model. We also have this gain component that allows us to adjust the direction of the motor. So we have a gain of one to turn the motor clockwise, and we can also put it to negative one to turn it counterclockwise. We also have a speed controller that uses the position signal and the um, state of the battery to scale the voltage applied to the motor accordingly. Next slide. Now that we have all of our drone um, components explained, it is compiled in this top level model shown there. So here is, we um, have a package for all of our test systems. Uh, on the left side, we have three of those three inputs. On the top, you have our, your X position, your Y position is in the middle, and your Z position is on the bottom. The, uh, we are able to integrate these visualization and animation using the multi-body library when we simulate this. And for a lot of these um, studies, we're only keeping a ramp signal on the Z direction to linear mo linearly move the drone up to a height of five meters while fixing the X and Y coordinates to zero. Next slide. So when we um, simulate the model, we get this a new window will pop up and you get this image of the drone. So we get um, the drone has been configured to use 3D object files to represent the propellers and the body. On the left is a trace of the drone animating. So the blue line represents the one on the right, the singular line is just the, the trace of the body. And then you have that circular um, response to represent, to show the trace of the propeller spinning. The, um, this shows that we have some sort of oscillation when the drone reaches its five meter height. Um, due to the dynamics response of the controller, but it also shows that we get some sort of animation of the drone when we simulate it. Next slide. Okay, so we studied the system for varying degrees of complexity, focusing mostly on the electric power system. The lowest level of complexity would be the ideal version of the component. So we're looking at the ideal version of the motor and the ideal version of the power system. When we're talking about the ideal version of the power system. We're not including a battery and we're assuming that we have infinite access to voltage and current and are, we can draw as much current as we want from a battery and have no issues. The most complex models that we have consider the losses in non-ideal behavior. We want to demonstrate the effects of modeling complexity on each of the components of the drone operation because this will help us determine the electric power requirements that are, will arise from different operating conditions. So here we'll look at the ideal motor and ideal power system, the DC motor and ideal power system, the DC motor with the battery, but without the converter, and then the DC motor with the converter, and then we'll look at that with a closed loop test to make sure we have stability. Next slide. Okay, we applied just a simple ideal reference tracking signal to see what kind of response we could get from the drone. We hold the X and Y direction constant for the entire simulation. And then in the Z direction over a 10 second simulation, we apply a one meter per second ramp for five seconds. And then we hover the drone at five meters for five seconds. So that this bar graph compares the energy consumption for all of the tests. Um, you can see most of the tests, the ramp and hover, there's not that much difference. We consume a little bit more power during the ramp and then um, we also, I wanted to note, we also tested an additional five tests where we apply a three kilogram payload. So that's test six through 10. Um, but of note, when we use an ideal power system, 
we consume a lot more power than we normally would when we have the battery because we're assuming that we can um, consume as much power as we want. Next slide. Okay, so now we wanted to look at how does the complexity and level of de modeling detail affect the motor um, output. So here we used the ideal and DC magnet, permanent magnet motors and looked at how their physical response in the simulation changed due to, in the reference tracking. So due to the increasing detail of the motor model, the force applied to the blades increases due to the increased damping when we use the DC permanent magnet motor over the ideal motor. You can see this in that thrust plot on the left. We have a significant, um, the more um, increased force from the damp damping of the DC permanent magnet machine. And you can see this also propagated into the reference tracking of the um, plot. So on the top, we have our ideal machine and on the bottom, we have our DC permanent magnet machine. The ideal machine has more of an overshoot because of the damping applied to uh, the damping of the machine applying less of a thrust to the drone. Next slide. Then we also wanted to see when we add in this DC to DC converter to step down and apply power to the controller, what kind of effect does this have on the system? So the way the DC to DC converter is modeled, we get this ripple in the battery voltage um, applied to all of the motors. This is because of the way that the transistors are set up and the switching of the component itself. The ripple varies over time depending on the state of the drone. The ripple decreases as we stabilize the system. Next slide. So now that we see that we have that ripple, we wanted to see how that would affect the drone's output. We get on the right, we have, are plotting the position input in volts to the motor, and then we are plotting the output torque of the motor. So, and we zoom in and look at it, we have that ripple still being applied to each motor, but the motor's inductances damp the output, so that ripple that's applied to the stator of the motor is not propagated to the output torque. But this gives us a little bit of a concern since we could have a lot of heat dissipation. This ripple could lead to a lot of heat in the motor. So we wanna study this in the future. And again, as the system stabilizes, the voltage ripple decreases. Next slide. So next we wanted to look at what happens to the system when we completely discharge the battery and when does the system fail while the battery is discharging? So we, hooked up the drone to the fully charged 11.1 volt three cell battery, and we just let it run. We put, let it run up to uh, five meters height and then just let it hover and see how long it could hover before it failed. Based on how the batteries are modeled, you can see that they run pretty much at a constant voltage until they hit a certain state of charge and they hit a knee voltage and completely drop off. So the drone draws about 12 amps from the battery and that has a 500 milliamp hour capacity. So as expected, we well, the drone will fall out of fail around 12 and a half minutes. When the voltage reaches eight volts, the drone goes into an unstable state and just kind of falls. Um, in real life, this might not happen. So we wanna be able to design a battery management system to be able to land the drone and track the battery state of charge before this sort of failure would happen. Next slide. And we also tested this drone for a noisy reference signal to ensure that we have stability of the controller. We apply the same flight path that we had before, but now we have a plus or minus five meter uniform noisy signal applied to the input. So on the plot on the right or on the left is the, the dash blue line is the ideal signal and then the red line is the noisy signal that we're inputting. So here we have it, have the plots of, of the energy consumption for the total power consumption shown in blue, and then the ramp of the drone and the hover for five seconds. And we only study this for the ideal motor, the DC motor with an ideal power system, and then studying it with the DC motor with the battery and without the converter. Next slide. 
So up till now, we've created an open source equation based drone model library. The model is publicly available at that GitHub link. If anybody wants to get started with Medelica, you can reach out to us. Um, there's some free versions and softwares that you can probably run this library in and we can get you started there. The only thing that you can't do is the visualization libraries are all proprietary. Um, all of these models have varying degrees of complexity, but we have a low fidelity model for the aerodynamics. We validated this model for a simple flight path. We know we can trust this model because the drone consumes an appropriate amount of energy over the given flight path and follows a reference signal adequately. We've studied the system under various power system conditions. So in the future, we want to add consideration for the cooling of the batteries. We want to add a more complex aerodynamic model, and we want to be able to study larger VTOL models for heavier aircraft. And future versions of this library will stress visualization development and system identification. We want to be able to export these models into a virtual reality environment so we can interact and play with it. So we need to add in collision detection um, so that when we export this model into VR, it won't run into obstacles in that environment. We also will have, be able to want to compare this model to the physical system that we have. We have a thing called an FFT gyroscope, which we can put a the Otis quadcopter that we have inside of and collect flight path data as a function of pitch on roll. And we want to use that to compare to our simulations and probably identify the drone model and validate it with the real world data. OK, that's all I have. Thank you. If anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Megan. We'll see. We'll wait for some people to type in some questions. Um, One question I had was, what type of instability did you have when the battery started running down? Was it truly an instability, or did it just run out of power and stop spinning? Um, it depended. So um, depends on the solver that you're using. Um, if you you depending on if you use a fixed time step solver or not it'll either just kind of run out of power or the solver itself will actually fail. So it's dependent on actually the simulation parameters. Okay, so that doesn't sound necessarily like a physical, a real physical phenomenon, more of a simulation effect. Yeah. <laughs> Another question. Do you have um, an idea of what, you know, you, you, you describe a low fidelity for aerodynamics. Um, do you have any idea of which areas of fidelity you need uh, to improve on for making this a, a more accurate model? No. Um, I'm not fully aware of that, but we got a lot of help from um, Dr. Farhan Gandhi and Dr. Um, Nemec at RPI helping us out with that. So we kind of ran out of time toward the end and needed to add in just a low fidelity model. So um, I'm not entirely sure about how um, complex we need to get, but I can ask them and get back to you on that. All right. Um... Don't have any more questions, so I think that will conclude uh, today's events. Thank you very much for that presentation, Megan. Thank you.